podium and <coughs> formally introduce our speakers. Richard. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, thank you, President Sullivan, and thank you for <coughs> your leadership in this area. And we look forward to your book on the First Amendment. <laughs> Um, so my name is Richard Watts. I'm one of the faculty who've been involved across the university to build a journalism program here. And it's a program that's going to build on the strengths of UVM and the great partnerships we have with media collaborations across the state like BT Digger and other of the robust and rich media landscape that we have here in Vermont. Here's our plan for the afternoon. Greg Bottoms and Jane Mayer are going to come up here and have a conversation in a minute. And that will be for about half an hour or so. And then lots of time for your questions. Students first, if we can. And because this is all about testing and experimenting and trying out ideas, we have a number of students here who are involved with trying to record or report <coughs> on this event. Taylor here, who injured his arm today, but is still here <laughs> to try and build a podcast that we are going to try and turn around tomorrow and would be available wherever you get your podcast. And we have some students taking photos, Instagram, uh, Facebook, all the things that you would do if you're in the media business. Um, one of the exciting things about building this program at UVM has getting, been getting to collaborate with some of the people here who do this at such a high level and have such a commitment to rich storytelling, as President Sullivan said. <laughs> Greg Bottoms <laughs> is an English professor who writes and teaches nonfiction narrative. His books, which are stunning, include Angel Head, My Brother's Descent into Madness, The Colorful Apocalypse, Journeys in Outsider Art, Spiritual American Trash, Portraits from the Margins of Art, and several others for which he has won a number of awards, including an Esquire Book of the Year. Our featured guest, Jane Mayer, as the President said, started her career in Vermont, working at a weekly, I believe, the Weathersfield Weekly, exactly. <laughs> the Weathersfield Weekly, and then at the Black River Tribune. That's right. Which is? And then the? Rutland Herald. Fabulous Rutland Herald. The fabulous Rutland Herald. And then the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, I think, and then the New Yorker since 95 or so, mm -hmm. as the political investigative reporter in DC. Not a lot going on down there, I don't think. <laughs> Um, her books include Strange Justice, The Selling of Clarence Thomas, written with Jill Averson, The Dark Side, The Inside Story of How the War on Terror Turned into a War on American Ideals, and Dark Money, The Hidden History of the Billionaires Behind the Rise of the Radical Right. For her writing, she has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize, the Goldsmith Book Prize, the Edward Weintel Book Prize, the Ridenhauer Prize, the New York Public Library's Helen Bernstein Book Award for Excellence in Journalism, and the Robert Kennedy Book Award, among many, many, many other things. <coughs> so, Jane, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm going to invite you and Greg to come up here. We are going to try and tape this, so I don't know what you're thinking, Taylor, bring the speaker but yeah. come on up and if anybody can't hear them we can we can put a mic on for the room but maybe we'll try it without it so let's welcome Jay Mayer and Jay Bottoms. okay well thanks very much to everyone for, for coming thanks to Jane for being here um, I want to start because there are quite a quite a number of students who are interested in journalism here with um, your just if you could talk a bit about your path to journalism what what sparked your interest your education first opportunities we just heard about your work in Vermont but the things that were happening before that okay well um, first thank you so much 
It's so nice to be back in Vermont, I have to say. Um, and it does always feel like home. And so I'm really glad to be here. And I'm glad to see there are a bunch of students. I hope some of them will become journalists because it's been um, really a, a fun job to do and also something that feels really meaningful, particularly at this point. So um, I didn't know that I wanted to be a journalist particularly. I kind of wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And it seemed like the one thing where you could continue to not make up your mind because every day there's a different story and something happening out there. And so I was a history major at, at Yale um, and I was very interested in American history and wanted to see what, you know, how history was going to unfold and I thought if I could just get in sort of near the arena I could watch it. And um, But it didn't start in that particular a grand spot actually for me. It started at, um, in earnest with my first real job at the Rutland Herald. Um, there's somebody in the room who gave it to me, Stephen C. Terry over there, who was my first editor. And um, my job was about as unglamorous, I think, as journalism can be. I had to uh, drive by the Rutland Hospital and pick up the list of um, who was born and who was admitted. And I, my, my beat was hospital news. Um, from, <laughs> uh, I also, from that you learn that you have to spell people's names right. Um, and there are facts um, that actually exist in the world. Not everything is a matter of debate. Um, and people are born and people do die. Um, and, um, and I also covered the town of Proctor which was um, outside of Rutland and um, actually was pretty interesting if you're interested in history because it was a town that had had a, a marble works and so it was a, it had a kind of paternalistic upper class that owned the marble works and then there were the workers who worked there and I, I got kind of interested because they while I was there they sold the company um, to a Swiss company and it was the beginning of kind of uh, you know, global, international, unknown, unseen billionaires kind of buying up bits of America and changing our culture. And so I was watching that. Um, so anyway, it was, it was I, I didn't last there terribly long, but I, I, I luckily made a bunch of mistakes that people didn't see too much because they, it wasn't right out there where everybody could see them. And I learned things like how to spell the word cemetery, which I <laughs> where it has a lot of ease in it. Um, <laughs> so things like that. Um, it, was, it, was, it was really fantastic. It was great esprit de corps. And um, you know, a lot of what makes uh, working in this business fun is it's a little bit like being um, part of a putting on a show or something, they're, they're, you work with other people that become kind of your, your gang. And if you have a really good editor who's excited about what you're doing, you want to work for them. And, 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 and Steve was fantastic. So um, it was actually a lot of fun. Yeah. Great. So. Great. Um, I, I want to ask a couple of, I guess, biographical questions before we move on, but so journalism's obviously changed in many ways, technology, media, social media, ecosystems, changing business models, partisanship, obviously, so forth, since you've been doing it. Um, you know, I just wonder how, uh, you know, how you've experienced these changes for better and worse in journalism from the time of the Rutland Herald through Wall Street Journal into the New Yorker. Well, it, it didn't seem that we were the targets so much, we reporters, when I started out. Um, and particularly in community news, the kinds of things I was doing. And um, I mean, people don't always love being covered. You don't, you don't go into this if you want everyone to love you, because frequently people don't like hearing the truth. But, um, but it, we weren't, it wasn't a political fight particularly about being a reporter that much in, in the beginning. And particularly, the Wall Street Journal is thought of as a very right-wing paper. It's, the truth is the reporters are not. So it actually was um, a great passport to get into places you might never get into otherwise if you didn't have the Wall Street Journal on your um, calling card, basically. But anyway, it's, we've become increasingly attacked. So that down to uh, more recently, when my my um, last book was about the billionaires behind the rise of the right, and 
um, the, the, the stars of that book are the Koch brothers, uh, Charles and David Koch. And when I first wrote about them in the, in the, in the New Yorker in 2010, I, um, I did profiles of them and um, they attacked me just um, in a way that I, I, I'd never been attacked before, even after um, covering things like the CIA and torture. It was, it was really remarkable how much of a sort of a political pushback there was. They hired a private eye um, who started digging through my life for dirt um, in hopes of trying to um, wreck my reputation. I didn't know it right away, but I discovered it one day when my editor, David Remnick, um, the New Yorker called me and he said, you know, I've got a couple phone calls here, one from the New York Post and one from uh, the Daily Caller, which is a right-wing website in Washington, and they say they have an expose on you and they need comment right away. And um, and they were, they were going to accuse me of plagiarism and, um, I'd never, nobody in my career had ever done that before. And I didn't know what it was about, and it was really scary. I had until the next day to try to give them some sort of comment. And so I asked them to send me what the charges were, and um, I looked at it, and um, um, luckily it was oh, just basically nothing. There were four sentences that they'd gone through 10 years of my work and found four sentences that seemed like other people's sentences. And so I, I, I called up the authors of the stories, the original stories, and I, one of them, I, I mean, I was trying to get a hold of them madly before, you know, getting back to these organizations with a comment. And I had to wake up somebody in the middle of the night to get a hold of her. And, and one guy was great. Uh, it was somebody from the Washington Post. And he looked up the sentence and he found the story. He said, "You know, when I wrote about, I I quoted it." He said, "Not only did you not rip me off," he said, "In the next sentence, which wasn't included in this charge, you freaking quoted me by name." And and he said, "And when you did it online, you linked to my story." Um, and so it turned out to be a a, a load of garbage. And I was able to get the four people to put statements on the record saying that it wasn't true. Um, but um, I sent that into these two news organizations. I took my dog for a walk, came back and looked at my email and they said they weren't running with it. But it was close, it was unbelievable. It felt like a bullet coming out of my head. Um, and so, um, so I learned from that that by 2010, the press was being um, targeted, and particularly the press that was trying to hold the right wing accountable, mm -hmm. and um, and powerful people in the right wing, oligarchs and plut plutocrats. Yeah. Um, so it's gotten it's gotten nasty feeling, um, but you kind of have to be up for pushing back. Yeah. Well, and and you're you're sort of at a disadvantage, I think, because you believe in you have a, a certain ethical demeanor, right? And you believe in facts and you believe in truth. And when when other people aren't worried about that, it's really, I mean, any means necessary operation that, that makes it uh, much worse. I, so to follow up on that, um, I wonder if just between 2010 and 2018, you're, because really there's a huge rise in, in social media mm -hmm. uh, between that, time and just attacks and I want I, I, I want to ask you about because I know some journalists some female journalists who have had a lot of threats threats of sexual violence um, and I just wonder if you feel like you're you're under a kind of constant threat or if you or do you just avoid social media I avoid reading the comments on social media <laughs> just for my my sanity um, no I, I, I haven't actually um, um, you know, I tweet sometimes. I'm careful about what I tweet, or I try to be anyway. It's amazing. I think Twitter is just such a so incites you to, to do the wrong thing. Um, but um, but but at any rate, I you know I don't I haven't been I really worried ever in doing this job particularly. When 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 I did the Kavanaugh story not so very long ago, uh, a few weeks ago where I wrote about a second woman who had allegations of sexual misconduct against um, now um, a, a Supreme Court Justice, 
Greg Kavanaugh. I, I knew that Kavanaugh lived a few blocks away, and it felt a little uncomfortable to think, you know, here I am writing this thing that, that I know is um, uh, going to make him very, very, very unhappy. Um, it's, it, can be, it can feel a little personal sometimes, but it wasn't personal. It's just professional. But, um, uh, but sometimes you wish they didn't know where you live. <laughs> right. Well, you know what? That makes me want to just ask about that since you, you brought it up. Can you, um, can you talk us through the, the Deborah Ramirez, uh, the, the reporting on that? The first, you know, the allegation, how you came, you did that with Ronan Farrow. Mm -hmm. The allegation, um, you know, and s just processing that. And you, you spoke a minute ago about working with the team and working with editors. I mean, this is, that was a hot potato if ever where there was a hot potato. It was a hot so, potato. and I know, I know you were, you know, you are meticulous. I know the New Yorker could not be more meticulous. I, my guess is that you, you, even now, feel very, very sure that her allegations are. Are legit, um, and which that that brings up other things about how it all turned out. But I guess my question is just: Can you um, talk us through the the kind of behind the scenes reporting on that, the from the allegation and, and working on that? And well, it was very different from the story that people have in some ways. I mean, the the story that's been put out. Um, the narrative has been somewhat set by the uh, Kavanaugh camp, and the, the story that they told was that um, that that uh, Diane Feinstein leaked out the Christine Blasey Ford thing at the last minute in order to have some kind of big surprise that was going to you know be nefarious, and um, and and they've they, it it wasn't really like that at all. Um, it, what happened was that um, Feinstein really didn't want to open up these, this story particularly. She thought that Christine Blasey Ford didn't want any um, um, publicity. And it leaked out organically because Christine Blasey Ford had spoken to so many of her friends. And, um, and, and she had been trying to figure out whether to come forward or not to come forward. And it circulated all around Palo Alto, where she lives, to the point where uh, Sheryl Sandberg even heard about it, and we began to hear about it, and so so that story was moving forward, and and um, when when after um, um, she came forward, other and and her story was being questioned um, by critics. What happened was other women who felt that she was being left out there to hang by herself, and other women who knew other things about Kavanaugh that were similar stepped up because they felt they had a responsibility. And, and, and so um, we began to hear about some of these other women. One, one woman contacted me. She was, this is not Deborah Ramirez, another woman who was the girlfriend of, um, of the man who was in the room with Brett Kavanaugh and, and, and Christine Blasey Ford in high school. He'd gone on to college. His college girlfriend came forward and said, he's lying to me. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then we began to hear about people at Yale who had stories. And I, I was at Yale. Ronan went to Yale Law School. Um, we heard about um, Deborah Ramirez through sort of the way you always hear things. Friends talk to friends. It begins to bubble around. We checked it out. She, she was not sure that she wanted to come forward at first. She wanted to make absolutely certain that her story was right and that she remembered all the details that had been 35 years before. And she'd been at a party at the time where there were drinking games and she was quite intoxicated. And um, understandably, she didn't want to walk out into the public stage of the world and accuse somebody of exposing himself to her unless she was 100% sure of it. Um, and so she was calling her friends saying, do you remember this? Did I tell you that? Do you remember this? Her mother, her sister, other people. And over a process of six days, she was talking to Ronan during this period. She felt strongly and clear enough about it that she wanted to come forward. And she'd also been working with a lawyer who <coughs> assured her that she could be protected. And that was a big issue, also holding her up. She was trying to think about, um, 
what she should do with her social media, what she should take down, how she should protect herself, whether she should change her phone number, um, move out of her house, all those kinds of things were going on. Anyway, she finally um, decided to go on the record. Um, she was very strong about it by the time she came forward. She said she there, there were a few things that were still hazy. We put that out there so that everybody knew there were some questions still about what she did and didn't remember. Um, and meanwhile, what I was doing while Ronan was working with her was following that um, she wanted the FBI to come in and interview her. So it had become a serious enough matter in her mind that she was going to be um, interviewed um, by people who were going to take a statement that she absolutely couldn't lie about. She felt strongly enough that she could do this um, and tell the FBI. And meanwhile, the Senate started <coughs> investigating. And as a reporter, for us, one of the things that crossed the threshold about why we put that story in print was not only was it a classmate of Kavanaugh's at Yale on the record with an, uh, giving a firsthand account of what she went through, but the Senate was investigating and she was calling for the FBI to take a statement. All those things made it absolutely a story we had to tell. And I, I read the reporting afterwards too about the, uh, that had to do with the people going to the FBI, trying to contact the FBI, the people from Yale, and not even being able to get in contact with them? She gave them the names of something like 20 people who knew things about her story, who could corroborate it, mm -hmm. and um, the FBI I think they went to one or two of them, but there were so many people they didn't talk to. There were all these people who I'd interviewed, it was amazing to me, who wanted to back her up. There were people who, there was one, one fellow who was a, he's a theologian and a, and a uh, professor at, at, at Princeton Theological Seminary. So a pretty upstanding person, um, without a lot of politics one way or the other. He went on the record saying he remembered hearing about her um, the, her, her allegations that night or the next day at Yale. He remembered it from 35 years ago. He was 100% certain. He knew more details about it than she did, and he'd never spoken to her. Um, he had said other than to say hello here and there. There were so many reasons to, to, to think that what she had to say was credible or at least deserved investigation, which is really what I, you know, what, what, what I think the thrust of our story was the FBI needs to look at this, um, and the public needs to take it into account, not only in its own right, but it very much backed up what Christine Blasey Ford was saying, which was that, that Brett Kavanaugh drank to excess, um, was a mean drunk, basically. They both remembered him laughing and humiliating them. There, his laughter kind of rang in their ears all these years later. And, and, and humiliating women sexually, particularly. That was what was going on, as far as um, both of them um, wanted to say. So um, anyway, it didn't change history, but it kind of made history. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, I wonder how you feel about the, the aftermath of that, too, and I guess the coverage of all the, the stories and accusations and how that you know, I remember reading, you know, David Brooks at one point in a column had mentioned, um, he sort of was lumping everything together and ba the, the gist of the, the op-ed piece was the left overplayed it. You know, the left over, so it just became, I mean, everything well, you just been, said. Ro Ronan Farrow and I've been blamed for, if, if the Democrats don't get the House, it will be our fault, <laughs> apparently, um, for, for writing about women who had allegations against um, uh, Kavanaugh. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it was, there was a lot of blowback. And, um, you know, when I'm working, I try not to write to make something happen one way or the other. It's not a political, it, it's not a political agenda. It's to try to get the story and get the truth out there. So whatever happens afterwards, but I, I, I actually, you know, don't think it's true. If you look at polls now, that it, it's, it's had blowback in various directions. I think it may have motivated some of Trump's base, um, kind of angering white men to feel that they're being picked on. 
Um, and um, I think that it's also very much motivated women. And if you look at, there's a piece in USA Today yesterday that had a, they had a poll that said that there is a Kavanaugh effect and the Kavanaugh effect is women want to vote. So. Um, well, good. The, um, well, let's hope anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I guess I want to transition a little bit to, to dark money. I've been, all of these things kind of overlap though. Because you know, talking about that, it makes me think a lot about just how much money was dumped into that um, Supreme Court appointment. To you know, that was going there was on. a ton. Yeah, oh, there's a group. There's that. a dark money group called the Judicial Crisis Network. That's now. This is the kind of thing that. So, I don't have the answer of whose money is in that group, and it's a kind of story that's still tantalizing to me. There is a dark money group. Um, it is spending millions and millions of dollars to try to affect judicial races all across the country. It's putting more than a million in right now in Arkansas because they have a Supreme Court um, race there. And, uh, and nobody knows whose money that is. There's somebody who, it looks like it's largely one donor, but there's somebody who's trying to buy America's courts and who's also put tons of money into confirming Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, um, and into the fight against Merrick Garland years, you know, back during the Obama period. And, and reporters like myself don't know whose money it is. The public doesn't know whose money it is. I'd love to know. Um, and so I've been trying to figure it out, um, you know, chisel, chiseling away at it, and not just myself. There are a number of reporters who keep, it feels like one of the great whales out there of, of big of political money. Yeah. So. Well, so let me let me transition a little bit to the new preface to Dark Money, which was, mm -hmm. so the paperback is 2017, is that right? I guess so, okay. yeah, right. So in the new preface though, you... you Maybe 2016, it was right after the election, it was like December, yeah. I think. Po yeah, okay. Post-election yeah. though, because you're, you're writing right. post-election, right. and um, you, you talk about uh, how the Koch brothers, you know, they did not want Trump to become the nominee. They did not necessarily want him to become the president, but once, um, n now they really see him as a, as a fantastic vehicle. It's very um, useful, yeah. And, you know, and the way, so, so they were, they helped, they very much wanted to pull out of the Paris Climate Accords and things like that. So I just, I wonder if you could talk a bit about um, kind of the, well, I guess the reporting in, in Dark Money, but you know what what it means now with um, with Trump in office. Well, I mean, in some ways, you could see the election of Trump as a refutation of Dark Money because they they did not put their money into backing Trump, and if the Kochs are so all powerful, then why didn't their candidate win? But what but what the truth is is that. They were waiting out the primaries, and they were going to put an amazing amount of money that their organization had raised. It was a kitty of $889 million. Nobody's ever seen this kind of money in one place in American politics, and they were waiting to spend that on a nom a, whoever the Republican nominee was. But unfortunately for them, the one guy who got the nomination was the one Republican candidate they didn't like. So they waited too long, and, and they were stuck with this, and, and were not sure what to do. So they poured money into all the lower level races all over the country instead, and didn't back Trump, got elected, um, and they had to figure out what to do. And they sort of looked kind of unhappy about it, but David Koch was actually right there in the back rooms of the high donors the night of Trump's election. He was there in New York where Trump was celebrating at the, I guess it was the Hilton Hotel. And there, lo and behold, was the libertarian, David Koch, who was already figuring he's gonna have to make his, you know, figure out some inroads here. Um, and they, and they, they actually, as you said, have found um, a lot of uses for Trump. Um, he's, 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 Trump came in without knowing anything about government, really. And they have a, an entire machine and have built up a, a lot of apparatchiks in, in Washington. And their people started taking <coughs> up top positions throughout all the parts of the government that matter to them. 
So if you look at the EPA, um, for instance, it's filled with people from Coke Industries. Um, look at tax policy. Look at people in the White House. Pence was one of their people. Um, they got their own vice president. So, um, and, and, and you don't just have to listen to me. Steve Bannon told me that Pence, um, he was afraid if Pence were ever elected president, um, that he would be owned by the Kochs. That was on the record in a story I did about Pence. I mean, everybody who really is on the inside knows that the Kochs have got sort of a lot of um, pull with the, the, the government that, that Trump set up. They basic, basically, they, they didn't win the, the presidency, they didn't win the election, but they've won the government. And, and that's what we're looking at. It's extraordinary. Well, let me, let me ask a couple more questions and we can open it up to everyone. Um, I, I wanted to get you to talk a little bit about the recent piece on Kathleen Hall Jameson's research and new book, Cyber War, you know, which is a fascinating piece. And um, if you could um, maybe just talk us through interviewing her and some of her findings. And I guess the question that I have is, do you, do you think I'll let you talk about what her findings are, but uh, do, I mean, do you think that her findings are gonna maybe become the commonsensical way we look back on 2016 and understand 2016? So, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, she, this is a, uh, Kathleen Hall Jamison is a professor at um, the Annenberg Center in Penn, and um, she's written a book that argues that the Russian uh, hacking of the election basically cha changed the outcome, and that without the Russians, Trump wouldn't have won. I mean, I think with an election that close, you could say without lots of different things, Trump wouldn't have won. So it may not be the only, the only factor that decides it, but she makes a pretty convincing case. Um, and what she's saying is that, 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 that the Russians, basically she calls them um, discourse saboteurs, and that they, they interrupted the narrative of the campaign. They continually interjected um, questions about Hillary Clinton's emails. They, they hacked into the DNC and, and the Clinton campaign and dumped that stuff out, which then became the, the main narrative. And um, um, I, I think she certainly, it's worrisome because what she points out is that our elections are vulnerable because of social media to being disrupted. And, and I, I, I'm not sure how much we've hardened them up since then, um, so. Okay, let me add, last question, then we'll open it up, because there are a lot of smart folks in here that I know want to ask you questions. Um, but I'm interested, what, what's the big reporting? What, what, what's, what's coming down the, the pipe um, for you, and, and maybe even just broadly in the, the political stories, maybe in, into the next year? You know, it's it's um, it's a weird time. We're sort of I feel like we're in limbo right now, waiting for this election, and we'll have to see what the midterms do. Um, if if the Republicans hold both houses, and we've now got such a Republican or conservative Supreme Court, I feel like the brakes are off for Trump, um, and and if there's more than ever a need for the press because who else is going to be holding him accountable? There's not a, a going to be a, a, another um, sort of uh, counterbalance out there. And we are, I mean, and it's almost a cliche now, we are not the opposition, we are not the resistance, we are reporters and we're just trying to report what's going on, but at a point when you've got so many untruths coming out from the White House and you're trying to correct them, you look like the opposition. Um, and we always do, you know, we are aggressive and oppositional no matter who's in power because our job is to hold everybody accountable no matter who's in power. So, um, so anyway, I think we're gonna have potentially a gigantic fight. Um, you know, it could get a lot uglier. Um, and if the, if the Democrats take the House, then they're going to be investigations galore and um, and then people with subpoenas will be able to get information, and they can do things that we can never do. Um, you know, we can we can call people up, but they can we can't subpoena anything. So, yeah. 
Um, so, you know, and Mueller's report's coming out. So we're kind of waiting to see if there really is anything criminal involved in um, the, the Trump's, uh, Trump campaign's work with the Russians or not. All right, well, thank you, and we, we can open it up to questions. Richard, if you want to. All right, first, thank you. All right, students first. I know Katie has a question in the back there. Yes. All right, you, and then we'll do Katie. Maybe shout out your name or something, and then shout it out if you're willing, yes. So it's a good question because it's sometimes hard to know who's reliable. I mean, the best thing you can hope for is to get people on the record so that they are responsible and speaking in their own voices and your readers can see who they are and what their credentials are and whether they are expert. Um, often you find people who have different points of view and what our job to do then is to have um, both sides represented so readers can try to sort of tease out you know, what the truth is between them if they're contradicting each other. So for instance, in the Deborah Ramirez story, I wound up um, calling uh, Brett Kavanaugh's lawyer um, to get her side of things. And she wanted me to speak to a few people who were going to um, undercut the credibility of Deborah Ramirez. So I, I interviewed them, and I tried to get them on the record. And I tried to listen to see whether, you know, did they know something about Deborah Ramirez um, that while we are busy trying to figure out her credibility too, was she, you know, giving us the interview from an insane asylum? Um, was she, um, you know, does she have a criminal record? Was she um, somebody who is motivated for some kind of personal or political or professional gain? You know, all these things you wonder when somebody says something. Um, so I asked the people who I thought would have dirt on her, and I went right to them and said, what do you know? Is there anything we should know? And what was very important to us um, in gauging her credibility was that the detractors who the White House pushed, pushed us to talk to said, no, we don't know her to be a liar. They knew her from college. She, she doesn't lie. She's, she's not manipulative. She's the least likely person to make something up, they were saying. So um, is she political? No, I don't think she's doing this for political reasons, they told me. So I said, well, you're supposed to be the ones who are her detractors. What is it you want me to say that would add some balance to this picture? And the best they had was someone who was an old friend of hers said, um, she never told me this before. And I, I know a lot about her. We've shared many intimate you know, memories, and she never mentioned that this happened to her. So I put that into the story so that readers can, you know, sometimes, you know, readers have to make their own judgments uh, in addition to the reporters doing it. We try to, to um, you know, um, to do the best job we can in evaluating them ourselves. I mean, there are sources who, who make stuff up even, and, and you've got to be very careful that you're not going to get somehow caught up in a hoax. Um, that does happen. So. All right, question. Katie, Katie did you say? Yes, Katie. Yeah. Um, so, I'm looking at the camera and seeing the brush and forth. It's um, like the whole ordeal is obviously very similar to. Um, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, obviously very similar to um, the Nita Hill case that we've covered in the Justice. Mm -hmm. But did you find that something so similar happened again? Did you find that shocking in any way? And I also wanted to ask, like, Well, I, I think because I've, uh, Strange Justice is a book about Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas um, and, and, and Thomas's confirmation hearings, um, 
because I'd spent so much time on that, that took three years to write and report on um, with Jill Abramson, who's um, the former editor of the New York Times and a great reporter. So it took the, the, the two of us three years. And because of that process, I had some idea what to look for. And that part of what, what you find in these sexual misconduct cases often is if it's a sort of a he said, she said standoff, one of the things that helps shed light on who's telling the truth is if there's a pattern of behavior. Um, and so it made a difference to me to hear that there were other women, and I knew that that was going to be important. So when Deborah Ramirez's story reached us, we leapt at it um, to try to you know, see if it was true, get it in print if it was. Um, same with the, the, the other woman who was challenging um, 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 Brett Kavanaugh from his high school story, the one who was the girlfriend of his friend at the time, um, and she was on the record too. Just looking for that whole pattern of behavior, I knew was going to be important, and um, and it, and and there seemed to be quite a pattern, quite a bit more than I had any idea of. I mean, it, most of us have in Washington have known about Brett Kavanaugh for a long time, and what was surprising was having done. I, I must have interviewed dozens and dozens of Yaleys who were there with him. There were, all this material came out that I'd never heard about him before. I mean, he was, he was described in pretty shocking terms um, and, and, you know, not very flattering terms by people, including his own roommates, who were on the record also. So anyway, all of that led to this filling out this picture that, um, and, you know, in terms of the feeling of repetition of history, I mean, on the, on the good side, other women came forward on their own. They really, they, they, in this Me Too moment, there's a sort of a sense of solidarity and other women were gonna just stand up and say, forget it, I'm not gonna not, I'm not gonna keep my silence, I'm gonna speak up. So that was encouraging in some ways to me, but, but the fact that it came out the way that it did and that there was never really a serious effort by the FBI to get to the bottom of it, and that the hearings, I mean, they were, they were, the process was designed by the Republican majority that wanted to confirm Kavanaugh. They wouldn't allow others to speak. Um, and so it was pretty preordained how it was going to come out. Um, I found that upsetting. I, I thought we'd come further after all these years. What is it, I don't know, 24 years or something like that? Uh, maybe, maybe more. Um, so I, I um, but, you know, we'll see. After Anita Hill, there was a wave of um, women who voted. And, and so I am curious to see what happens in the midterms. Others, all right, Colin. Yeah, um, I'd be interested to uh, kind of hear your thoughts on the ongoing trend in the US of people searching for news sources that match the politics they already have. How would you try and fix that from your position as a journalist? Well, I think it's really important to talk to people who don't match your political views. I mean, and so, for instance, as I, I quoted Steve Bannon to you, and to me, it's incredibly important for me as a political reporter to talk to Steve Bannon, to talk to Kellyanne Conway, to talk to, I, I wanted to talk to the Koch brothers. I was really sorry that they didn't give me an interview, but when they didn't, I went to, you know, as far as I could to find, I got to talk to childhood friends, and you know, I, I eventually, for the book, wound up talking to many people in their family. You really can't understand anything if you're only talking to one point of view, as far as I'm concerned. There's a whole process that this is part of, which is, to, it's just like what happens in any kind of research in the universities, or in science, or anything else. You need to get, gather all the information, maybe have a hypothesis, but then test it. Um, and you, you know, by the time you go, go public with something, you want to feel that it's, that it's right, or if you're not sure, you want to have the opposing um, information out there. Um, so I, 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 I really deplore the idea that people are only talking to people who are going to confirm their biases. You know. Um. Good. Um, by the way, students, chime in too on things that you care about in journalism, why you're interested in journalism. I'm sure all of that is. Uh, all right, more questions or comments? Four. Yes. Um, sort of going off of that previous question, I just I really admire 
admire um, the ways in which your, your journalism is so complex and uh, investigating all of the different angles and how important that is. Um, but do you feel that for a majority of the working public, sometimes news sort of becomes condensed to what you can watch on television or see on social media? So do you ever feel like your stories get flattened or condensed <coughs> or summarized when they're presented in such a form? Yeah, I mean, it, um, you know, we're kind of dinosaurs at the New Yorker writing these endless pieces that, you know, come up. And I have a daughter who's, you know, uh, just got out of college herself, and I'm incredibly happy she's actually reading the New Yorker. And But, um, but you know, we have to compete with much more um, concise and uh, very, you know, ways that news is delivered. Um, I, th I, you know, I think a lot about how to make people read through all that material and kind of eat the spinach um, and hide it in there as much as possible. And um, and partly, um, a lot of what I do is try to hang, I try hang the complicated stuff on real stories. I mean, I I I I have to believe that most of us are still interested in a great yarn, and and that we're interested in other people. So a lot of the time I wound up, I mean, writing about other, I mean, characters. And um, and so for instance, the, the Dark Money is a book about something that's just deadly dull, um, which is um, campaign finance, you bit money in politics. You know, you could so go to sleep reading about that. But what I was trying to do was wrap that around the story of a couple of the, the richest and most calculating men in the world who um, have used their fortunes to try to obtain power and push this country in a direction that a lot of people, the mass, the majority of people in the democracy don't want to go in, but they've used their money to push it there anyway. And so that becomes kind of a yarn, and it's a story about, about willful people and, and kind of amazing characters. Um, so, anyway, I'm hoping that drags people through these stories. The, the dirty secret of the New Yorker is we get paid by the word. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you ever, one, ever wonder why did they use ten words when they could have used one? I mean, often you don't know what the story's going to, I mean, you don't know what the story's going to be until you get into it and start interviewing people, and sometimes they take you in an opposite direction from wh where you were expecting to go. Um, I mean, that, that, that actually happens a, a, a good bit. I mean, you have to really be, it's, it's a fact-driven process, and, and you have to be open to it taking you wherever. I mean, the book on Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill, it, when Jill and I, who had been friends since high school, so we sat down, we watched the hearings, and we thought, wow, this is unbelievable. Which one of these people's telling the truth? You, you couldn't tell for sure, and it could have come out either way. It could have, th there were a number of people saying that Anita Hill was, they called her an erotomaniac, who had, you know, fantasies about uh, of Clarence Thomas, and had made this whole thing up. So, you know, we had to speak to a lot of people who knew her to find out whether or not that was true. Um, and that, it, it took three years of talking to people, but by the time we were done, we talked to so many people who remembered Clarence Thomas being obsessed with pornography and um, speaking just as Anita Hill had described him speaking to women. And it, um, 
<laughs> it even got to the point where we knew what his favorite porno pornographic films were, and I was getting engaged right around this point, and somehow one of my friends for an engagement present found one of his favorite <laughs> porno films and gave it to me. So, um, <laughs> it's called Big Mama Jama. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, that's research. I mean, see, there are some... <laughs> I mean, I, it's, I, I, it is frustrating sometimes and tantalizing. I mean, I still get um, doors slammed in my face and show up at people's houses to try to interview them. And um, you, even, you know, this, in, this, in the coverage of Kavanaugh, there was, there's a, there is somebody who wouldn't go on the record with a story of a, another thing happened at Yale that was just like the Deborah Ramirez thing. And no matter what I did, I could not get this story into print. I tried, I, you know, I went to somebody's house to try to talk them into it. And there was just, we, it's, it's just, you can't always get it. Um, and, and that's frustrating if you feel like the truth's not coming out. Um, but it's, it's always, it's, it's interesting. Um, it can be a little demeaning at a certain point sometimes, but, um, but, but, it's fun to hear how other reporters do it. I, 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 I remember hearing Bob Woodward talked about how there's a special time when he likes to phone people. It's, it's right before dinner. Basically, he's always, he's hoping to call them after they've had maybe a cocktail. <laughs> and, and so I tried it once or twice, and literally once, I got somebody and I could hear like the clinking of ice in the glass. I'm like, yes, this is gonna work. <laughs> it did. So <laughs> but it doesn't always work. Others, yeah, all the way in the back. Um, I have a question maybe a little bit more on your national security reporting. Um, going back to I think the first question that was asked about the reliability of sources. Um, it seems like different outlets and different reporters kind of have different positions on quoting people anonymously, especially in I mean, you always want someone to go on the record. So there's, it's kind of a, a, a unconscious equation in your head. How good is the information? If, you, if, if it's really good, um, it, then you may you use it anyway when somebody won't go on the record. There's certain other rules. You're not going to put something in print that's an ad hominem attack on someone without their name attached to it. It's not fair. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of, you know, dirty pool. So you're not going to do that. But, you know, the problem is in, it, as we're, you know, at a moment like this, when there's a lot of fear attached to um, uh, government, there are a lot of people who can't afford to speak on the record. They know they're going to be fired. Um, and I've got, you know, it's gotten, it's gotten really, so what I think of is kind of almost un-American. I once was I was a reporter um, behind the Berlin Wall right before the wall came down briefly, and people there had to be so careful about what they said and how they got you know to make sure the authorities didn't see them speaking, and it was very elaborate to try to get a hold of people. So I think of that as kind of the kind of thing that happened under the bad old days of communism. And, and so I'm surprised to find here in this country now so many people who they worry about speaking to you on the phone, 
they don't want to put anything in email. Um, you know, they're downloading apps like Signal, um, which is actually a great app. But people also, some people won't even do that. You have to try to find a way to meet them in person. And I've done that with, I've had to do that with people who want to tell me things that are going on in the White House, but they don't want, they just can't risk having anybody know. Uh, a few more. Yes, Tricia. Any let me I'll come back to you in a minute. That's the up there. All the way in the back. Throw it out there. And by the way, is my sign up list around there somewhere? Can you keep it moving? <coughs> ah. Send it up to Adrian maybe. Yes. Please. Um, hi. I was wondering in the growing sort of antagonistic battle between the current administration and the new media and how there's these things that there's a kind of return to a point where people can trust the media while someone still in in power or whether you think it has to wait till you whether they can trust the media, well, did you say? Well, there's constant attack on the media. Yeah. I, I, I kind of heartened, recent, recent um, surveys have showed, I think it was a Pew study, showed that um, trust in the media is going up. Yeah. Um, and certainly the circulation of the, the failing New York Times um, is going up, and so is um, the, 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 the New Yorker, um, too. So um, I think in some ways Trump is making the case for why you need a strong yeah. media. Um, to, you know, not on purpose, but it seems to be an unintended consequence of some of these attacks. We'll do a few more. There's somebody here in the middle somewhere. Yeah, Joey. Yeah, I um, was reading Nick Kristoff's uh, column the other day and just talking about how Trump is receiving all this attention from the migrant caravan to kind of like um, basically distract people from the elections and also important issues. And around the last presidential election, there's a lot of talk about how the media I was wondering, like, how you, I was wondering how you feel about whether it's important to let people know what our, you know, president is thinking and saying versus, like, giving too much coverage to something that won't so It's one of the hardest questions, which is, you know, whether to um, just give him uh, the attention that he wants, um, because he ha seems to have a sort of insatiable amount of need for attention. And but most presidents, you, I mean, it's part of the job is that you're going to cover them, what, whatever they do. And I was a White House reporter who covered Reagan for the Wall Street Journal, and so we had to cover his, you know, every every gesture and also. Um, but it, it's a it's a problem with with Trump because a lot of what he's saying is so inflammatory and you don't want to be used and you don't want to be part of some deliberate effort to divide the country along um, really damaging lines. Um, and you're trying to correct the things that are false, but um, it, you, you, it's, it's hard to be out there fast enough. And, um, and when he tweets, do we need, is a tweet news? It kind of is these days. But but um, it's how much how much attention should you give it? I, I think these are all discussions that are very much alive among reporters who who are covering these things. Um, I mean, my personal feeling is that 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 Trump has a, a real kind of love hate thing going with with the media. He he says it's the enemy of the American people, and he calls the New York Times failing. But he kind of craves their um, coverage all the time, and, 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 and in particular, the Times. I mean, he's, he's kind of in awe of it. Um, he, you know, he deals with Maggie Haberman, who's a fantastic reporter at the Times. Eric Lipton, you mentioned, is a fantastic reporter at the Times. And he'll, he'll call, he does call them back. And I, I, even, even at the New Yorker, he's called me back. Um, and, so, and, and he was more available during the 2016 campaign than Hillary Clinton was. Um, and you know, you would think that she'd call the New Yorker because we're thought to have this, you know, kind of liberal leaning, um, um, you know, I guess bias or something. I, I, I'm not sure that, whatever. Um, but, but, but at any rate, I could not get an interview with Hillary Clinton. I tried to reach Donald Trump and um, I was doing a piece about the, the uh, Tony Schwartz, who's the ghostwriter who really wrote um, The Art of the Deal. And two days after putting in a request to speak to Trump, my phone rang. 
And it's like this familiar sort of purry voice, and it's like, <laughs> hi, this is Donald Trump. And, um, and, and it, was, it, was, it, it was, you know, and he said, and so you're at the New Yorker. I love the New Yorker. <laughs> and, um, how long have you been there? And, um, and, 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 and he, was, he wanted to talk for such a long time. I was running out of questions. Uh, <laughs> so and so, but he said, you know, it was funny because he said, that he loved um, Tony Schwartz. And I said, you know, I don't think he's going to be voting for you. And, um, and, um, and he said, he's not. He said, he said, he probably thinks that's good for him, but that is not going to be good for him. And his whole tone became like very menacing. And he said, you know, that is so disloyal. And so, so after I got off the phone with him, like a few minutes later, my phone rang again. And it was Tony Schwartz. <laughs> and he said, Jane, did you tell Donald Trump that I'm not voting for him? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, I did. Um, it's true, right? And he said, well, yeah, it's true, but I haven't talked to him for like 25 years. And he chased me down in my, in my car on my phone and you know, told me how disloyal it was. And he said, he said that some, some reporter from the New Yorker, he said, um, had told him this. He said, and by the way, it's a failing publication that nobody reads. So, it was, anyway, but there he was on the phone, whatever, you know, and he calls people back. Um, and he invites these reporters into the White House, you know, and, and there's the, these amazing tableaus that, that they have. They describe how there was this wonderful scene in the beginning when he took over the White House, the Times had, where he, he was wandering around in his bathrobe and nobody could figure out where the light switches were. And, and so there were sort of room, darkened hallways and, 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 and he's in, he invited Olivia Nuzio recently in from New York Magazine. And um, you know, just, it, it's, it's, for someone who hates the media, he, he wants the media to follow everything he does. So you're, the question you asked originally is should we? Um, and it's 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 really a hard one, and I think we're trying to work out the answer. And I wish I had it, but I don't. So, Greg, I'm thinking just a few more. What do you think? A few more questions? You're, yeah, that's fine. That sounds good. Go. Mm -hmm. Trish. Yeah, two questions. Um, first of all, you said the Koch brothers didn't win the presidency, but they won the government. I'm wondering about the other side of the equation, all the people that stayed in their jobs and it lasted through a couple of administrations what their relationship is with the Koch brothers people and if they can slow the thing down, the slow the train down. That's question number one. Number two is what is your daily media diet and what would you recommend to college students here who want to be journalists? What should they be reading every day? So the slow them down people are, I suppose, what what um, the, the Trump administration looks at as the deep state. Um, <laughs> and, um, and they do, you know, they do exist. There are people who are non-political appointees, who are ex subject area experts, who are in the um, government, and they make it work. Um, there's a really good book. It's actually a series, a series of articles that became a book by Michael Lewis. I don't know if, if, if you guys have read it. He's a wonderful writer, really entertaining, and it's about um, what these people in government really do. And basically, they keep you from having um, meat that's going to poison you and water that's going to you know, pollute everything and uh, nuclear weapons that are in unsafe condition. And it's a great book that describes what the bureaucracy does. And um, so yeah, they're there. I mean, their job is to work with the elected people. Um, and they have to, um, you know, in some cases it's, it's, it's causing huge tension when the people who come in basically want to destroy the bureaucracy that they are running. Um, it, it, it's, it's, so um, it's, it's, it's been very tense and interesting. And those are some of the people who won't go on the record, but who you need to talk to as a reporter. Um, I, I, as far as what I read, um, I try to read a, a really wide variety of things. Um, I'm a, unfortunately an incredibly slow reader, um, and so I wish I were faster. If I could change something, it would be that. Um, 
but I, I, I read the New York Times, I read the Washington Post as sort of the, the basics, and then I read the Wall Street Journal, and I, I you know, daily, I, I look at all three of those. <coughs> and then on Twitter, I follow about 500 different places um, and, and writers, and anybody could go up and look and see what I follow. Um, it, it, it's a range from far, far right, um, you know, places to some, some pretty far left. Um, I, you know, I feel, I, you know, I just keep, keep in touch. I hear more from those people, so I'm, I'm, I'm more trying to cover for the people, you know, keep in touch with the people who might not be talking to me um, to see what's out there. Uh, so that's sort of my, my daily diet. I'm, I'm married to the Washington editor of the New York Times. Um, so um, I, I, I hear a lot about what's in the news, um, even without reading, um, for better or for worse. <laughs> Colin, did you have a question? Well, I guess, going back to the two questions ago, um, you mentioned kind of having to decide <clears throat> how much you want to be putting out into the media versus, I think earlier you were talking about how a lot of your job is not really thinking about any political background with what you're putting out. And I guess if you could talk a little bit to, is it, I mean, I guess, should the media be worried about the amount of time that they're giving individuals rather than just trying to get as much information out as they can? Well, I mean, I, the, so the, what I'm writing for, instead of trying to push uh, you know, serve a political group, particularly, is for readers. Um, so I'm trying to keep the readers always foremost in my mind. Um, and so I think, like, any time that you're, you know, overly, overly reliant on one source, say, one, one, one place, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, you can become too dependent and too lazy if you just call the same people over and over again. I mean, there are sort of known um, blabber, blabber mouths who are very helpful. Sometimes they're very smart people, but you know, you feel you're, I mean, especially when I was a newspaper reporter, you know, you want to write a, a 25 inch story and you're only at 18 inches. There are a few people you can call and they'll always give you a quote. Um, and, um, and, but your editors are usually onto it. And, um, and so the, after a while they say, you know, could you stop, to, you know, do you always have to call the same person? Um, so you, you should try to get a variety. Real people, the people who are not um, the professional talkers are often the most interesting. I mean, it's, you just have no idea what people are going to tell you when, you know, you cannot, just like, you, you can't really predict. If you, if you, you may sit on a bus with people and kind of wonder who they are, and the thing about being a reporter is you can actually go up to them and start talking to them and ask them, and they have amazing backstories. Um, and so it's very good to get out and do that and talk to the unexpected person, get out around the country and talk to people. Um, I, I really enjoy that and get around the world. I mean, really. So, um, and it, it, it keeps the writing much fresher, too, if you can do it. So, that seems like kind of a nice place to stop. Do you have, Greg, anything you want to add or conclude with? I have questions about. We don't have enough time lying and um, the, the way, you know, the idea that Donald Trump told 170 lies in the second week of October. And I just, I mean, it, it, cre it does create, I mean, he's a sort of genius of media. I mean, that is his genius, is the, just the sort of... He's good at it. It's not, it's a mistake to, to underestimate him, I think. Yeah. And he's good at speaking at those rallies. You watch him. He's, he's an entertaining guy. He can be funny. Um, he knows how to work a crowd. I mean, I think, you know, there was a, a really interesting thing about lying that just was, ju I was just looking at, I'm sorry to say Twitter, right before I came over, but it was an interview with Scaramucci, who was briefly his... You know, I guess the, what is it? Eleven days. Eleven days. Eleven. Twelve days. How many days was it? Eleven. I can't remember. Eleven. <laughs> um, whatever. And but but Scaramucci was just giving an interview where he said Donald Trump, he doesn't lie like other people lie. Um, he does it. He lies deliberately. He does it. And I think this is right. 
He's lying as a strategy. Um, it's not, um, you know, there are a lot of pe reasons in, that people lie, but there aren't too many people that, that sort of deliberately lie strategically like he does. And, 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 and to, want to, 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 to some extent, he's lying in order to undercut the idea that there is such a thing as anybody telling the truth. Um, because it, oh, it, you know, it raises the hackles of people like me and all the usual suspects, and we come in and we correct it, and then we look like scolds, and um, and then we look political, and then he can discard us. And basically, after a while, what happens is, is what you know, what scholars of authoritarianism say is the aim of lying like that um, is to make it seem like. You can't believe anything. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's true anymore. And when, when, when nothing's believable, as the quote is, everything's believable. At that point, it's really hard for democracy to work when nobody knows what information is true. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the strategy. Yeah. And that's, that's the meta issue. I mean, that, that is sort of the big, the, the big issue, I think. Um, but anyway.